Good, um, good evening, everybody. Welcome to um, the third uh, Haunts themed session of the Sheffield Hallam University uh, Place and Space Group. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about um, the haunted uh, battleground. My name's Luke Bennett. Uh, I'm the convener of the group and the um, chair for uh, this session. Uh, I've got a couple of able colleagues who are going to tell me when I sort of forget to turn myself off mute or some other stupid thing, but uh, uh, assuming that those things aren't currently active, they're not, you can hear me. Uh, we are uh, going to start tonight's proceedings, so you're all very uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to be running according to the advertised agenda, except for one change, uh, but we will be finished by half past nine. Uh, we do have uh, five main presentations uh, for you, uh, and uh, so I'd like to uh, start by uh, just setting out a couple of uh, couple of points of housekeeping. Uh, there'll be a 10 minute comfort break just just around about halfway uh, through. Um, we've turned off uh, audio for um, uh, delegates uh, and also we've turned off um, video uh, too. So the mechanism by which We'd like to um, gather your reactions to the presentations and your questions for the presenters. Each presenter will have a five minute Q&A session at the end of their presentation uh, is via the chat box, please. So please do type your questions um, in there and then I'll field them at the end of each uh, presentation. Uh, we are recording, as I've said, um, the recordings of the previous sessions have been uploaded to um, the YouTube channel that you see described there. And the plan is to upload this one there two. Um, if, and this is applicable for the presenters and also for uh, anyone in the audience, if you feel that a contribution or an involvement that you've made to the events this evening has been likely captured by video and you don't want it to be captured on video for posterity, please do let me know, but please let me know within the next 24 hours, because uh, otherwise it will just get um, uploaded. Okay. So uh, just a couple of opening words from um, <clears throat> me before we get into um, the proceedings tonight. Uh, this is the third in a series of four uh, uh, events, all of them exploring the notion of uh, haunting uh, and hauntedness as it relates to uh, place. We've previously been looking at uh, sort of folk uh, notions of hauntedness and haunted places and the practices that haunt a place uh, in a more prosaic sense. Uh, just uh, a couple of months ago, we were looking at um, the notion of haunted homes, the domestic uncanny, if you will. Uh, and tonight we're turning our attention to the haunted battleground. We're going to have an event in May or June. And who knows, it may even be down to earth and face to face and physically in person. Um, although actually I've quite grown attached to these online um, uh, formats and the way in which we can pull in quite a lot more people than we might uh, in, a, in a face to face way. Um, so we're looking at the haunted uh, battleground tonight, the, the, the peculiar qualities, the particular qualities by which it might be said um, that battlegrounds have an ongoing sort of resonance and what, what might be the cause uh, for that. Um, and this image, uh, when I was looking around for an image to anchor this uh, particular uh, session around really struck me. It struck me because it wasn't the obvious uh, haunted battleground image that we might normally have. There was an un undulating restlessness in this picture of uh, uh, Vimy, uh, Vimy Ridge, Vimy, For Vimy Memorial Forest, First World War battleground. Um, and to my mind, this image here is much more unsettling, I think, than this one, which is of the actual Vimy um, uh, monument. I mean, that's a powerful monument, but it's heavy, rigid, intentionally elegiac, uh, almost serene in its white cleanness. Um, you know, there we are. Now then, the one person who can't come this evening uh, is uh, uh, one of our presenters, uh, Rebecca Hearn. Uh, and Rebecca has kindly given me permission to read a few passages from her presentation. And I'm going to start off with one to try and set the scene uh, today. Uh, and then I'm going to um, perhaps, if we have time at the end, return to a couple more passages from Rebecca's uh, presentation. So Rebecca is a PhD student um, based primarily in the architecture school at Sheffield University, uh, but also liaising into the um, English literature department. And I think this comes out quite clear in the uh, uh, extract that I want to read for you. Her work, or this aspect of her work, is about 
um, uh, accompanying a group of, uh, I think they were Afghan, Afghan, Afghan war veterans uh, to a dig project at the Waterloo battleground. So these uh, veterans were obviously carrying the trauma of their own wartime experiences and their own battlegrounds from, from, from far away uh, and had a very sort of an evocative experience in the viscerality of digging into um, the uh, battlefield um, over at Waterloo. So I just want to read a short passage of um, Rebecca's writing to sort of set us into the, into the mood for uh, what will then uh, follow on uh, through the other presenters. And in doing so, I need to make the point that I, I tend to be quite um, relaxed, borderline flippant in the way in which I, I steer these events. And I'm conscious that I need to be a bit careful of that this evening, uh, because, of course, it is quite a heavy you know, subject matter. So for once in my life, I'm going to try and read this straight. OK, there's no irony in what I'm reading. This is my attempt to sort of set the tone uh, and get us sort of thinking and feeling. Hang on, what we're dealing with here is actually quite, quite quite sombre. The lion's mound is powerful, its impact on visitors visceral. Standing atop the monumental pedestal, it is difficult to visualise the thousands of tonnes of soil collected to form the mound beneath one's feet. This soil, drawn from the battlefields, contains bone fragments, lost teeth with historical fillings, clay pipe bowls blackened from anxious chain smoking and tatters of cloth punctured by bayonet blades, sometimes decayed and sometimes stained with young men's blood. Musket balls, fired but flattened on one side, preserve the moment when a young man jammed his ramrod too hard down the barrel of his gun while loading it in panic, causing it to misfire, injuring or most likely killing him. Shreds of family photographs, letters, memorandum books, tokens and talismans imbued with meaning and significance and intended to ensure a safe passage home. But these instead were swallowed by thousands of tons of blood soaked soil. As one project participant mused, standing atop the monument on that searing July day, you just feel that, you just feel that weight all the weight of the past is here. So these are the proceedings we've got for you this evening, uh, as advertised in the program, uh, and uh, we're going to work through them. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing speakers. I'm going to invite them to introduce themselves, keep with the informality of the event. And so therefore, I'm turning uh, my screen share off and inviting our keynote speaker, uh, Jilly Carr from uh, University of Cambridge to introduce herself and to lead us into her presentation. So over to you, Jilly, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Lou. Thanks for inviting me to speak this evening. And it's really quite an indulgence for me to have this opportunity to talk about um, ghosts from the field and the my, my background, which I'll turn off in just a second because it eats bandwidth, apparently. Um, is one of the most haunted um, places from the German occupation that you can find in the Channel Islands. And if I just move to the side, you can probably feel the vibes of it uh, already. And really, uh, if I can, I'm just going to turn my virtual background off, beautiful though it is. Um, and so I will, I don't want to eat any of the bandwidth. So. Well, now I'll try and share screen. Oops, share sound. Share. Okay, so I'm going to um, start off by, uh, oops, a daisy. Start off by telling you that um, my family is actually from the Channel Island of Guernsey, which is the inspiration, I guess, behind this. And I guess there are two reasons why I got into this particular subject. And one of them is a story that came from my mother who uh, grew up in Guernsey. And one of them is from my own experience. And I will tell you my own experience a little later. The image that you're seeing now is um, a road in Guernsey that is frequented by the ghost of a German soldier on a motorbike. And um, the Channel Islands are um, were occupied by German forces from 1940 to 1945, the only part of the British Isles to be occupied. 
and they are still haunted by ghosts of that German occupation. So uh, let's just have a look at the questions that we're going to be um, discussing today. And those questions are, how can archaeologists write and talk about non-metaphorical ghosts? Because when I first had my own experience and spoke about it at an archaeology conference, I was actually told off for doing so by the conference convener who peered at me over their spectacles and said, archaeologists do not talk about ghosts because that was deemed to be too folklore and not, archae not archaeology -y. Um, so I'm, I kind of really resented that. I wanted to find my own language for talking about ghosts. So I want to know what is the potential for the experience of haunting to be considered as a form of intangible heritage, because that gets us into the um, language that's used by those who work in heritage studies. Can we talk about ghosts as intangible heritage? And does that help us fit ghosts into the wider experience of heritage of a place, heritage of war? And can ghosts be taken seriously by academics as a lens through which to understand the legacy of conflict upon a people and place? Now, I'm not an anthropologist, I am an archeologist and anthropologists get to talk about ghosts a lot, ghosts are the bread and butter, ghosts and spirits, the bread and butter of anthropologists, but not archeologists. So this is really about me trying to break down that disciplinary divide and to claim some language by which it is possible for people who work in my field to talk about the reality of what they encounter in the field. And that reality, um, well, I will get I will get onto the reality of that in a minute. But really, uh, the important thing to flag up is that I am talking about uh, real ghosts, if that's not a contradiction in terms. I'm not talking about ghosts as metaphor, although the metaphor of still being haunted by the German occupation would also be very accurate to describe people from the Channel Islands. So they're both physically and literally haunted. So we're going to be exploring this subject through a case study. And um, the, the image you're looking at here is um, the same as my was what as that which was my backdrop just uh, a couple of minutes ago. And when I was writing an article for the Guernsey Press um, on my own experience in order to collect more data from other people's experiences, this is the image the newspaper mocked up of a, of a German soldier in the tunnel. But we'll get on to that a little later. So for those of you whose geography is a little bit uh, fuzzy, let me show you that the Channel Islands are um, in the Bay of St. Malo and they comprise five islands that have been British for more than 800 years. And in order of size, they are Jersey, Guernsey, Alderney, Sark and Herm. And um, I look forward to the day when the pandemic rates are such that I am actually allowed to get back to the Channel Islands because I've been missing it an awful lot in the last 12 months. So this image here shows um, German soldiers marching through St. Peter Port, which is the capital of Guernsey. And um, I use this image just to point out to you that in small islands where not a lot happens, um, well, apart from a pandemic, um, wars can really have a very big and long lasting impact on a community. And uh, it's certainly true to say in the Channel Islands that the memory of the occupation still haunts people. And those memories are everywhere. There isn't really any getting away from it um, because it's everywhere in the landscape. The German occupation still features in the local papers. Um, most days when people are making references back to the past, it, it provides islanders with a sense of identity and a sense of difference that they are different to people from the mainland because they were occupi occupied and, and we weren't. So just to show you some of the images which we see across the landscape in the Channel Islands, we see um, bunkers like this everywhere. So these bunkers are um, on the coasts, they are in people's gardens, and some of them take this sort of tower form and some of them are tunnels. I'm gonna use the word bunker regardless of whether I'm talking about um, towers or tunnels or just generally these concrete structures which were used as everything from gun emplacements to um, these sorts of lookout functions where you could sort of peer through it with your gun waiting for people to invade, etc. 
so some of these bunkers and tunnels have been restored and some are unrestored and um, I think the first time that I plucked up the courage to go into this particular tunnel um, I was a teenager and as I say my family's from Guernsey so I've been going to Guernsey every year since uh, as my mother says before I was born um, and um, this particular tunnel because of its reputation for being haunted I didn't go in there till I was a teenager and because it's it's one of those places that's very echoey so your footsteps sound like marching soldiers and so you quicken your pace a little bit and the soldiers start to march a little faster behind you until you're kind of trying to get out of the place it is very creepy um and when I went back there for field work so this is probably about 10 years ago I went out of season I got permission to enter this out of season um this place is entirely unrestored there's no things put there for the tourists it is just this empty damp dripping place there's no recordings to make people feel freaked out or anything but as I got halfway through the I felt like I was being watched and um, in, in the best tradition of these ghost programs on telly um, I had my dictaphone with me which I always have with me for doing interviews collecting them in the field anyway not on the subject of ghosts but I had my dictaphone with me and I held it up and I said you know I knew the reputation of the place I said if there are any if there's anyone here who wants to speak I have a machine here that will record your voice thinking that you know if it's a ghost from the war they're not going to know what a dictaphone is so explain. and feeling complete full um I put my dictaphone on and just held it in the air for 10 seconds and uh and felt rather daft and just sort of I was getting pretty freaked out so I just made my way out of the tunnels pretty soon after that and when I got home that night and listened to the recording on my computer not expecting to hear anything at all I was very freaked out to hear the recording that I got. Um, now I've amplified that recording because the sound comes through as a whisper. And to help you, this I, I'm going to play it and then I'm going to tell you what I hear and then I'm going to play it again. And I hope that this will work. So what I hear there is a little silence and then I hear, help us but whispered, help us. Or maybe there's a sort of a, a long drawn out ah, before that. But before the help us, I hear a very a quieter help us. So it's like a help us, help us. So you tell me if that's what you hear too. I'll ask you at the end and you can tell me if this is what you hear. Yeah. And again. So this was unexpected. This is a genuine recording, whether it hit, whether it's the sound of something else. I, you know, I can't tell you what it is. I can only tell you genuinely what I heard. And um, I played that recording to a number of people in the Channel Islands who are my uh, my field work informants, as anthropologists call them, um, people who run occupation museums, people who restore bunkers, etc. Not one of them disbelieve me every single one of them took it entirely seriously took it in their stride and said oh yes um it's well known that that bunker's haunted um let me tell you my story every single person responded with a let me tell you my story and didn't really bat an eyelid at this recording whereas when i got back to cambridge after field work and played it to friends they shuffled in their seats they peered at me over their glasses and their estimation of me dropped I could see reflected in their eyes so it's very interesting that the context of where you are and um, how seriously people take you um, so I, I'll perhaps come back to this particular tunnel um, I also want to show you that as well as there being unrestored bunkers there are restored bunkers and this is just a, a typical um, range of photos from inside restored bunkers there are literally hundreds of bunkers in the channel islands so the typical restoration mode is to take old shop mannequins and to dress them in uniforms german uniforms and to recreate the view inside the bunker as it would have been during the war 
Um, frequently, this involves hanging swastika flags. Sometimes this involves putting up pictures of Hitler. This isn't deemed to be anything to do with neo-Nazism. It isn't deemed to be problematic because this is what people have been doing with bunkers, with heritage display in the Channel Islands since 1946. It's a, a very sort of long lived. This is what you do with a bunker. You put mannequins of German soldiers in it or you turn it into an occupation museum. So this is just some, and there are loads of occupation museums in the Channel Islands, which is surprising for a small, small islands, but um, you can see that some of these are inside bunkers. And again, some of them have this little kind of time capsule element to them. Otherwise they tend to be vehicles for displaying collections of militaria that the owners have been collecting since they were schoolboys, and it's very much men who collect this sort of thing in the Channel Islands. So, um, you know, there are just mannequins everywhere, uh, soldiers, uh, soldiers at play or soldiers at work, but never soldiers doing anything Nazi-ish. So never, you never see soldiers deporting Jews or uh, deporting political prisoners. It's always they're either manning the guns or they're playing chess or listening to the radio or something, you know, fairly innocuous. But this uh, image here, which comes from a postcard from Jersey War Tunnels, really to me summarizes that feeling, um, both the feeling in the Channel Islands generally uh, of how people feel about being occupied, that you know, the occupation still casts a long shadow, but also the feeling one has when one is inside a German bunker. You do get that feeling of being watched. Um, and there's enough people who have stories of having seen ghosts of German soldiers. So basically the phenomenon, the heritage phenomenon in the Channel Islands is that there's no escape from the occupation or from German soldiers. And they're always referred to by the way as German soldiers rather than Nazi soldiers for um, reasons that aren't important here. But there's uh, a widespread belief amongst the second and third generation. So people born after the war that ghosts of German soldiers still haunt bunkers. Um, and as I say, islanders are still metaphorically and literally still haunted by the occupation. And people have come to me with stories of seeing ghosts, hearing them, smelling them. Uh, and you, people will report being able to smell German tobacco, whatever that might smell like inside bunkers. Definitely, it's very easy to feel or sense the presence of something. Now, I'm not psychic. I make no claims to have any powers in that department but um, the feeling is a very real one when you go into these places. And for me, when I go on field work, doing my archeological field work or heritage field work, I always feel that you have to suspend disbelief, suspend judgment and be open to whatever it is that you experience doing field work, because that's really the only way you can authentically do your work. Um, and so when one feels things, you know, that's something to put in the field work notebook. And Although I've had my mother's story of, you know, knowing that this particular road was haunted by a German soldier on a motorbike, the first written account that I can find of ghosts of the German occupation comes from a Guernsey folklore book that was published um, nearly 50 years ago and is written by Mari Degaris, who um, published her book Folklore of Guernsey in 1975. And I'm just going to read you out this quote that says, um, so this is from the book, one evening recently, 1975, a young girl was cycling along the road by the airports when she came upon a platoon of soldiers in grey uniforms marching along. When she got home, she asked her mother and her neighbour if any soldiers were in the island. She was told th that there were none. Well, there are some now. I've just seen them, she replied. She described the men and the neighbour declared immediately, these are the German soldiers from the occupation. I've seen them myself and so have other people. One rather suspects, as Mari de Garis wrote, that as time goes on, more stories of hauntings which have their roots in the occupation will come to light. Well, in my field work, I've visited many of these sites, um, sometimes taking local people with me. And <clears throat> um, the two women in the photo here are um, a friend of my husband, um, Sharon here. She uh, is psychic, but that's her. Uh, admission and this is her daughter Evie who has inherited some of those abilities and when I was going around that same tunnel complex uh, that I showed you where I had my own recording I went I went around with them and they told me that they could both see soldiers 
guarding slave workers and these bunkers were built by slave workers and um, when I, I said to these women how do you see these ghosts how does it work and she said well it's like when you look at someone but then turn your head away you still have the image of what they look like you know what they look like but they're not still in front of your eyes so you know I merely pass that on for your information um, locally in the Channel Islands if you take photos inside bunkers and you get an orb in the photo as I've done here, which happened to occur between Sharon and Evie, um, this is taken to be proof of spirit presence. So um, I would often take Sharon with me as I went to bunkers because I was just really interested in what she could see. You know, this is part of the data collection. Um, I just want to give you a couple of stories of other people that I've interviewed. And there's been a lot of interviews I've carried out with people who have seen ghosts. And these are just a couple of interesting ones. So. Um, Anne told me that when we were in this particular bunker complex called the Myris Battery, she said, I went on an organized ghost hunt in the Myris Battery. As we walked down the tunnel, I distinctly heard someone screaming in what I thought was Russian. So the slave workers who came to the island were, among other nationalities, Russian. A real panicked scream in my ear. I went white. It felt like a get me out of here panicky scream. I definitely think it was the spirit of a slave labor. And Steve told me, um, so at the Myris Battery, they also play war games, <clears throat> amusingly and ironically enough. Um, they play with, um, with these sorts of guns that fire soft pellets. And he said, at the bunker, we've had what sounds like an old German radio station in one of the rooms. German voices faint in the background. And about four years ago, I saw a figure disappear down a corridor, looking like he was wearing a long military coat. I've seen him three or four times. We call him Fritz. So, so Fritz is locally known to be the ghost of the Myris battery and um, the, the image of Sharon here, I was with her, she was, she was reporting such interesting things of what she saw. I can, I can see there are 10 questions in the chat and I hope uh, I haven't seen them yet, but um, I'll maybe elaborate on this when there's more time. But I wanted to show you this particular photo. This was taken in Jersey by a couple of men who had gone ghost hunting uh, as is popular to do. Um, and they had a very terrible experience in this particular tunnel complex. Um, one of them collapsed and felt like he was being, uh, just after they took this photo, uh, he collapsed and felt like he was being strangled. And his friend had the presence of mind to put, you know, felt that it was the right thing to do to put his hand on his friend's head and to recite the Lord's Prayer. And apparently this made the friend feel okay again, that there wasn't anyone trying to strangle him, but they both, um, got out of the tunnel as fast as they could. And they told me that um, they felt they had been um, possessed and that they were both dogged by the most incredible bad luck in the months after this experience. And all of the electronic goods in their homes failed, um, their marriages failed, they tried to seek help at the hands of a, of a white witch, um, you know, or you know, where we're disappearing into a whole other lecture and time is limited, so I'll pause there. But what I wanted to show you in this photograph, they said to me that whenever they look at this photo, when they've looked at this photograph on their, on their computers, their computers had failed. So they gave me this picture and said, well, just, we, you know, we did tell you, be careful before showing it on a computer, so we'll see what happens. But the images that they say they can see in these photos is of a North African slave worker wearing a turban on the left hand side and there were slave workers from North Africa. So what he what they say they see here is a turban, a bearded face with a moustache, mouth, nose and the eyes. I hope you can see my cursor here pointing this out. And on the right hand side, this is a German soldier wearing a peak cap, which comes down almost to their nose and you can see the chin, the mouth and the cheekbones. So I don't know if you can sort of see the cap here. Um, and again, you can see an orb. So, you know, I, I, I make no claim to this photo. I merely pass on to you that which was shown to me with the explanation that I was given for it. So let's go back to that place where I had my own recording of the voice saying, help us. And um, this is Sharon in the red coat once again. And um, she said to me, well, where were you? Well, actually, no, I'm there are multiple people I talked to about this. Um, one of the experts of the German occupation in Guernsey, I told him where I was when I had found this recording. And he said to me, where in the bunker were you when you had this recording? So I got out the little map of the, of the bunker and I pointed to him where I was. And he said, oh yes, that's where a tunnel collapsed, killing some slave workers in 1943. 
so we went back to that site with Sharon and Sharon um, she had this particular sort of um, dream in the night about the slave workers needing to be rescued so we came back with um, this is my husband manning a camera um, this was the uh, retired dean of the island and another as a clergy woman here the dean at uh, the time he this was um this man's actually my uncle um, and he's brought some holy water to splash to north south east and west and we tried to kind of exercise this place uh, it was a terribly uncomfortable experience. Maybe I'll get onto that, but uh, we haven't got a lot of time. So I'm just going to sort of tell you the story. And I really wanted to um, begin to analyze what we're looking at here. So where those people have restored bunkers and brought them back to how they would have looked during the war. And yes, this is a picture of Hitler you can see on the wall here. Um, people are sort of creating a, a time capsule realism. This is sort of past presencing a Sharon McDonald has called it and it's very clear that what is valued in heritage presentation in the Channel Islands is this feeling of being close to the occupation as if the Germans have just left the room it's a it's an, a very important way of getting at authenticity and um, it's that is something that's for because most of the people who are alive today in the Channel Islands didn't live through the occupation they were born afterwards and you know it's the most exciting thing ever to happen to their islands and they missed it and so by having a heritage that makes you feel that you're tired you're close to it that you if you blink if you turn your back a german soldier will enter the room it's almost inviting the ghosts it's almost you know the ghosts are there in front of all of your senses except your your sixth sense and i just wanted to show you these images of an overgrown bunker the view from a bunker door and um, of an old barred um, entrance to an underground tunnel complex. This is the most haunted one in Jersey. And I just wanted to flag up that these bunkers, um, in a way, they almost don't need to be extrasensory places because all of your senses tell you you can detect ghosts. They, these places breathe. They have like a, a breeze through them in the way the London Underground does. They have a smell. They have they make funny noises. They have funny echoes like marching soldiers. They're, they're cold, they're damp, they're frightening and they're dark. Um, apart from the ones that are open to the public, there's you just can't see you can't see your hands in front of your face when the doors are closed. They're very atmospheric. And um, I, you know, I've definitely noticed a kind of generational patterning here that the first generation basically saw soldiers in houses, which is where the soldiers were billeted during the war. And the first generation also saw ghosts of soldiers in the street, which is where ghosts, which is where the real soldiers were. But it's the second and third generation who don't see them in the street, don't see them in houses. But when they see ghosts of German soldiers, they see them in bunkers, because in a way that's where they expect to see them. That's where the mannequins of the soldiers are. Um, I can see there are 18 comments. I will type some of the comments if we don't have time to talk about them in the five minutes allotted to me. Um, so, you know, I wonder whether ghosts are almost created in the mind of people who go to these sites because um, they're expected. You can almost see them without being psychic. Um, but, but also, um, and, and I'm kind of speeding up a little bit here. I, I don't know, I mean, you know, as I say, it's all about keeping an open mind when you do field work. It's not about what you believe, it's what it's about what the people you study believe. But, you know, why do people go ghost hunting anyway? Because most of us, you know, we're scared of ghosts, right? We don't go seeking them out. Um, although perhaps everyone on this on this call, you know, um, do go seeking them out. But people are very curious about ghosts. They are, um, you know, the, the concept of being able to contact a German soldier ghost why it's almost as if you were living during the occupation it really is about vicariously experiencing the occupation and um when i first um spoke to uh, there's, there's an anthropology professor in cambridge called Piers piers vitebsky who does his field work um well all over the place but he's well known in cambridge for his ghost research and he said to me what is the what is the role that ghosts play in social relations in the channel islands and you know, because I'm not an anthropologist, it took me a while to really understand the question. But after many months of sort of thinking it through and talking it through, I realized that the role that ghosts play is they, 
they are the, in, the uninvited guests who outstayed their welcome. And that was true between 1940 and 1945. And that is still true today. They, you know, they're, they're, the ghosts are not invited. They've stayed after 1945 and they're still playing a huge role in occupation heritage today and local identity. So I, I just wanted to, um, these are some photographs my husband took. He's a, he likes his amateur photography and he went to um, a Halloween party in a nightclub in Guernsey uh, a few years ago and, you know, dress what you dress as you wish on a Halloween party. Most of us would you know, dress up as a, a cat or a ghost or a witch, but it seems in the Channel Islands, people dress up as zombie German soldiers. Don't ask me where they get the uniforms from, probably best not to ask, but you know, these ghosts are keeping the occupation alive. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of irony here in the language, isn't it? To talk about ghosts keeping the occupation alive and to talk about ghosts as being a real way of experiencing the occupation, but it's, they are a tangible part <laughs> of keeping the occupation alive, despite being intangible dead people, you know, to all intents and purposes. And I, I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes um, just touching base on the UNESCO Convention on Safeguarding Intangible Cultural Heritage, because I want to frame ghosts as, intang as, as intangible heritage. And I will, um, you know, I'll leave it up to you to read the, the details on the website of UNESCO, but just to, just to quickly go through this, that intangible heritage includes, um, it's not the physical stuff, it's the intangible stuff. So it includes all traditions and expression, performing arts, rituals, festive events, it can be dancing, it can be singing, um, practices, craftsmanship, things which don't have a physical uh, component really. And I just highlighted the bit that I see as relevant to the Channel Islands. So um, article two of the convention defines intangible cultural heritage as including the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge and skills, and the instruments, objects, artifacts, and cultural spaces associated with therewith. I won't carry on reading this out, but just to flag up that intangible cultural heritage is transmitted from generation to generation. And this is how it is in the Channel Islands that people pass these stories on down through the generations. So, um, and also to say that, you know, in a way bunkers and ghosts are indivisible. The bunkers, are the tangible heritage and the ghosts are the intangible heritage, but you can't have the ghosts without the bunkers and the bunkers would just be empty shells without the ghosts, even though they are empty shells, but it's, you know, these things are really intertwined in the Channel Islands. But I think as well as thinking about them as intangible heritage, we can also think of them as what I call a tangible intangibility and the tangibleness is is the tangible evidence of the senses of digital media of photographs of dictaphones of people um you know and, and of the bunkers themselves this is the tangible part of the intangible bunkers so um you know yeah you can you can challenge this you can dispute it you can deny it but this is often done by people who haven't had their own experience. And I've interviewed about 40 people in the Channel Islands who have had their own experience and people accept it as well. Um, if I say to someone in the Channel Islands that I've had an experience, I, you know, most of the time I won't be poo-pooed, uh, I'll be believed. It's an accepted thing by many people. I'm not gonna say by all, I haven't interviewed the entire population, but, um, I just also wanted to bring to show you a couple of quotes but, um, to illustrate these sorts of beliefs and acceptances in the Channel Islands that some people talk about bunkers as a recording medium as if the concrete of the bunker in, in the words of islanders can absorb the energies of the people who have lived and worked there so that when the conditions are favorable such as during storms or something the bunker can play back the recording of the German soldier well that was one explanation that was put to me um, and someone else um, reminded me of the story of how the slave workers who built the bunkers were, were believed to have, um, when they fell into the concrete, the German soldiers wouldn't fish them out again because they were expand expendable. So either way, you end up with, with bodies trapped in the concrete, which is a, an interesting um, part of understanding this sort of tangible intangibility. Well, we're getting almost towards the end. I do see the time, Luke. Uh, I just wanted to show you a couple of cartoons. And this one is from 1975, and it's a cartoon of Germans still occupying bunkers with this fear that they never really left. And the, um, and the cartoon shows these old men coming out of a bunker waving a white flag and the policemen are saying, 
hey, Jack, I think I've just discovered who's been raiding the beach kiosks all these years. And so, you know, it, it really plays into this idea that the German soldiers are still there. And this is one from Jersey, and this is from a 1998 tourist um, tourist um, promotional, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, well, there, there were posters made up saying, Jersey, where there's something to keep everyone occupied. That was the, the theme for tourism that year. And um, the, the, the quote here is, uh, yes, all of these soldiers have suddenly arrived. He says they haven't worked since 1945, but they'd be delighted to help out with our new campaign. So again, the soldiers are always there, always ready to be summoned. So my final thoughts before questions are, are just, how can we write about ghosts? And I, as archeologists, I suggest that we, we talk about the intangible heritage of war and talk about ghosts in that way, or we talk about these ghosts as possessing a tangible intangibility. I think that they are a, a legitimate area of study and a real legacy of conflict. Um, and as intangible heritage, they offer an insight into how conflict is locally remembered and understood. And I pass on to you the words of wisdom from Piers Vitebsky to me. If you are researching ghosts in the field, um, the question to ask is what role do ghosts play in social relations in the present? Well, I'll end there. And if Luke is staring at me too hard, as I will observe in just a second, it's only because, Luke, you went five minutes over. So I apologize if I've eaten into my own question time. No, no, I, I did go five minutes over and I, and I didn't want you to feel um, pressured because you kept rigidly to, to, to the actual time period I gave you. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you, Gillian. We'll give you your five minutes without any compression. So um, can I take the, the questions, Luke, or do you want to? Well, um... I'll steer through the I'll steer through the questions. I think quite a few of them are observations. We have we have a fair few sort of folklorists for various reasons in the audience, and um, I think uh, to try and pull those observations into questions probably requires me to do a little bit of mediating. Um, in fact, I had to look up two words that I didn't even know what they meant, um, but I now know what ostentation uh, means in folklore, and it doesn't mean what I thought it did. Um, there was a question uh, that was raised ar around the issue of are the bunkers um, somehow mediating between the, the, the culture that is the sort of folklore stories and the physicality and somehow generative of of new stories or a better explication of things that linger almost unsayable within within folklore. That's my attempt to, to, to summarize what ostentation seems to mean within folklore studies. You sort of answered that actually. And one of the pleasantly frustrating things, Julie, is that I've been trying to scan for questions and formulate them. And as soon as I formulated the question, you actually answered the point. So um, to, be, to be perfectly honest, I'm struggling a little bit to find something that you haven't already answered. Can, but, can I take yeah, some, Luke? Would that be all right? Do you mind? Yeah, go on, go on, go um, for it. I just want to, um, I'm, I'm sort of, um, I haven't been reading this as we were going, so I'm dipping in and out a bit. Um, I, I see that. I want to make very clear that I um, do not think the people who told me these stories are deluded in any way. I don't think that Sharon is deluded at all. I know her very well. She's become a close personal friend. She is psychic. Um, I know that when I talk about these ghosts in different, um, in different settings to different groups, um, I always have to um, you know, and archaeolo the archaeology archaeologists in the audience would give a, give a very different response to the anthropologists, and I'm glad there are lots of folklorists here. So um, I want to make clear that I believe in what Sharon sees. I believe that what Sharon tells me she sees is what she does see. I, I don't think she's deluded at all. And when I was in the bunker um, with her, as we walked into one part of the bunker, uh, I was walking alongside her. I felt like, suddenly I felt like I was walking into gloop. That's the only way I can describe it. And I stepped right back and said, oh, I don't like that. Sharon, what is this? And she said, Jilly, you just walked into a German soldier. So having had my own physical, and I, you know, I, I make no claims to any psychicness. So having had my own physical experience and my own um, audio experience, I, I absolutely, um, I'm not in any way saying that uh, any of these people are deluded at all. I, I believe them entirely in what they say. And I do want to find a way to talk about it academically because uh, in my field, in archaeology, you can't talk academically about ghosts without everyone thinking that you're deluded as, a, as an academic. So I just want to make that clear. 
Um, I wonder, uh, I wonder why we never want to know what the ghosts want. There's always something in the idea that they want something from us. What does this tell us about the social relationship they have with us? How do we understand their desire? I mean, these particular, um, the ghosts saying help us, wanted to, um, basically, as I understand it, their bodies are still trapped in the concrete and they want somebody to come and let them out. Um, this is what they were asking for me. Luke, if you've spotted a better question as I as I try and take these uh, on board. Oh, no, you go skimming, go skimming, that's good. You can, um, you can dive in if- I will uh, on it though, yeah. Um, okay. Okay, now, I mean, the anthropologists um, always very say it doesn't matter whether you, as the academic, believe or not what it is you're observing the important thing is to um it doesn't matter what i believe it matters what they believe and uh, and i um have lost my skepticism but i do uh you know when you've had your own experience in the field i just think when you do field work you have to be open to what it is you're experiencing and witnessing and, and feeling and that's you're not really going to understand what it is you're seeing otherwise I've got a question for you, Julie. Go for it, go for it. You talked about the sort of generational by generational sort of remaking of meaning and attachment and significance for, 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 for these, these places and the ghosts connected to them. Where next? What's, what's the next generational step? And, and, and will there be a fading or is it going to be constant recreation because this physicality is going no, isn't going nowhere? And yeah, the yeah. Culture is embedded in a way that isn't going to disappear. What What's your thought about the future progression of this? Yeah, I, I, it's a really really good question, Luke, and one I think about. So I think that um, because this culture, this occupation culture, is still very predominant in the Channel Islands, and every occupation day, um, sorry, on Liberation Day, I should say, on the on the 9th of May. It's the prime time of year for passing stories about the occupation down to the next generation. And I think that, um, you see the people I suppose that I meet and interview for my field work are people who lived through the occupation, the first generation, the second generation, people down to my age and maybe um, those who do war games and stuff in bunkers, but I haven't interviewed children. Um, and I don't know whether children are sort of old enough to fully ab have absorbed their own, um, their own understanding of the war. I guess they haven't perhaps been necessarily taught about it from the school yet. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested to know because of course, whereas my grandparents were adults during the war, um, the next generation, I, you know, as the generations go by, they have they will lose their, their immediate, immediate contact because they will not have relatives who they knew who lived through the occupation because it will be you know, their grandparents will have been born after the war. And so I wonder how much of that will be lost. Um, and it'll be interesting to see where that goes with ghosts. But one thing I can say with how this is changing is that only since about the year 2000 have the slave workers been part of the story that people tell about the occupation. And um, only very slowly are they becoming part of heritage presentation. And the more recent ghosts that have been seen are ghosts of slave workers. And I wonder, as people's historical consciousness and heritage consciousness changes about, you know, victims of Nazism, begin to think about them, then people begin to see them as ghosts. And this is this is interesting to see the change in what people see and experience. Thank you. I think we'll, um, if you don't mind, Julie, we'll, 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 we'll cap it there. And yes. I'll just thing to everybody just to keep us moving along. And, uh, and we've given you the, uh, the, the full range of the time. So thank yep. you very much. And I've, I'd heard that presentation before, and I'm so glad that we were able to get you to come along and do it um, in this forum. So, so you're very welcome. Yeah. I'll, I'll type some answers in the chat to some of the questions. I'll Lovely. go through them. Lovely. Thank you very much. OK, so if I can invite um, David Clark now uh, to the virtual podium. Hello. Lovely can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Lovely. I'll just Brilliant. let the slides launch, then I'll turn my camera off. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay. Uh, yep, it's up and running now, so I'm gonna disappear. Brilliant. Okay. So I'm David Clark, um, Associate Professor in the Department of um, Media Arts and Communications here at Sheffield Hallam University. I'm also a co-founder with Andrew, who you're going to hear later, um, of the Centre for Contemporary Legend. 
and I describe myself as a folklorist and journalist. I'm not sure which one takes precedent. Um, but what I want to talk about tonight um, is a story that I began researching, ooh, must have been um, after my uh, completion of my PhD um, with a British Academy grant at that time um, into um, various rumours um, and stories that were spreading um, during the First World War. So we're moving from Jilly's presentation talking about story, stories that have originated in the Second World War. We're going backwards in time now um, to the First World War, to the legend of the Angels of Mons. And I've added, uh, did a bit of last minute revision on this and added and Mars. And it's an interesting little timely um, addition to this that um, takes us right to present day with the landing of the Perseverance rover. And you'll see the, uh, the relevance of this shortly. So, a hundred years ago, uh, the great European powers were drawn into the first war that was fought on a truly global scale. Four years of conflict produced an outpouring of both literature and art, and many of those who were caught up in the carnage found sustenance in religion and other types of supernatural belief. There were national calls to prayer and, to, and the notion of God with us encouraged the idea on both sides that, the, that their armies had divine protection. Other people reverted to what historian Paul Fussell has called a medieval mindset that encouraged belief in a variety of apocalyptic prophecies, superstitions, wonders, miracles, rumors, and legends. So the greatest legend of the Great War, the Angels of Mons, emerged from the first battle fought by British troops in Europe since Wellington's forces defeated Napoleon at Waterloo a century earlier. At the time, the Belgian battle had a symbolic importance that far outweighed any strategic importance they had. Okay, so the legend began on the morning of the 23rd of August, 1914, when the professional soldiers of the small but well-trained British Expeditionary Force collided with the advancing first German army along the Mons Condé Canal in Belgium. The BEF were heavily outnumbered, but they managed to hold back the German army long enough to allow their French allies to regroup on the Marne and save Paris. The retreat from Mons inspired the Welsh-born author of fantasy fiction, Arthur Macken, to write a short story that he called The Bowman. And this was published in the London Evening News on the 29th of September, 1914, one month after the battle. Macken could never have imagined that his words would become the source material for what has been described as the first urban myth of the 20th century. Now, Macken's story appeared to describe a wonder that had occurred during the heat of that first desperate battle. It told of a group of British soldiers who were outnumbered, cut off, and surrounded by the advancing ranks of the G German infantry. And just at the moment that all hope is lost, one of their number, who is described as a Latin scholar, draws strength from an image of St. George, the patron saint, that he saw adorning a plate in a restaurant just before his regiment departed from England. So in desperation, as the shells are falling around his, his friends, he calls out to the saint, Adse Anglis Sanctus Georgius, St. George, help the English. And as if by magic, a shudder and an electric shock pass through his body as the roar of battle dies down. A chorus of voices cry out, St. George, St. George, and a long line of shapes with a shining about them appear before the trenches. They were like men who drew the bow and with another shout, their cloud of arrows flew singing and tingling through the air towards the German host. The singing arrows darkened the air and the heathen horde melted from before them. And as the enemy infantry crashed to the ground, the English soldier says, that St. George has brought his Agincourt bowmen to help the English. Now, readers of the evening news were left wondering what was the status of this story? It was presented as a narrative in the voice of a soldier in much the same way that the newspaper had been presenting actual stories from the front. Um, it was surrounded by um, hard news as we would now call it today. There was no context for the story at all. 
And at the time, Macken dismissed this little story as an indifferent work, work. But he spent then the remainder of his life insisting it was the genesis of the legend that was to become the Angels of Mons. And his protest made little impression upon those who came to believe that real bowmen and angels, and maybe St. George, had intervened on the Allied side, not only at the Battle of Mons, but elsewhere in the war. The ferocity of the battles that followed the retreat and their uncertain outcome encouraged an, an expectant and anxious atmosphere on the home front that was respect, receptive to all kinds of supernatural ideas. Now, speculation about Mackin's source continues in the present day. Back in 1915, rumors spread that he had been tipped off by a military source or that the idea for the bowman had been placed in his hand by a lady in waiting sent by a highly placed source in the British royal family. There was also a theory that Mackin had received a telepathic impression of the vision of Bowman from the brain of a dying soldier on the battlefield at Mons. But in his um, best-selling 1915 book, The Bowman and Other Legends of the War, Mackin provides a clear account of his inspiration. He said it took one week for news of the battle of Mons to reach London. On his way to Mass on the morning of, the, of Sunday 30th of August 1914, he saw the billboards of the newspapers that told of heavy losses and the desperate need for reinforcements at the front. And as the priest sang and the incense drifted above the gospel book, he saw a furnace of torment and death and agony and terror seven times heated and in the midst of the burning was the British army. During the ritual, he imagined the archers who fought for Henry V at Agincourt, invoking the Celtic saints for protection. And in writing the Bowman, Mark Macken admitted that he dipped into a deep well of legend and myth that stretched far back beyond Agincourt. His story drew upon a range of sources from Herodotus's account of supernatural invent intervention in the Persian Wars to Rudyard Kipling's Lost Legion. And by one of those odd coincidences, and we don't know whether it was by accident or design, the editor of the Evening News published The Bowman on the 29th of September, 1914. Now those folklorists among you will probably recognize that as the feast day of the Archangel Michael. And in Victorian art and iconography, both St. George and St. Michael were interchangeable. Both appeared as shining warrior angels that, um, that protected Christian soldiers and slew dragons. And the clincher for those who knew was the reference to a long line of shapes with a shining about them in Macken's short story. And in 1915, Macken wrote that in the popular view, shining and benevolent supernatural beings are angels and nothing else. And so I believe the bowmen of my story have become the angels of Mons. So within days of the appearance of the bowmen in that evening newspaper, the editor of the evening news began to receive letters from readers asking for the identity of the soldiers who had witnessed the miracle on the battlefield. Requests also came from the editors of spiritualist magazines that were very popular during the Great War. They wanted to republish Macken's story and ask for the authorities upon which he had drawn. I could not give my authorities, Macken responded, because I had none, the tale being pure invention. But those, for those who had lost loved ones in the slaughter, they were comforted by these stories and by these tales, and the angels provided an ideal conduit for a renewed outpouring of faith and patriotism. Clergymen used the story in Sunday sermons as a morale booster, replacing the martial bowmen with angels. So initially you get the stories about people, soldiers having seen um, bowmen and St. George at the front, and then slowly as we move into 1915, those stories disappear and they are replaced by stories of angels. And that was perhaps more suitable for the audience. And six months after Macken produced his romantic fantasy, reports of angelic visions of the front were published as fact in newspapers, following a series of, of sermons preached on the 23rd of August, 1915, St. George's Day. 
So rallied against Macken in 1915 were those who believed in divine inter intervention. And the patriotic author Harold Begbie claimed that Macken had exploited a true story for his own commercial ends. And he published a riposte um, to Arthur Macken that presented eyewitness accounts of soldiers that claimed that Macken was wrong, that they had actually seen angels at the front. And, they were, and but unfortunately, his theory was shattered when a key testimony that, that was given under oath by a soldier from the Cheshire Regiment was revealed as a hoax. Now, soon afterwards, newspapers published more definitive evidence, this time from Miss Sarah Marable, who was a daughter of a canon of the Church of England. The Daily Mail, uh, that really um, believe you, a newspaper that you really would believe, um, claimed that she, that, that, that she had got first-hand evidence from two army officers. They had seen a troop of angels appear between the British and the German lines at a crucial point in the retreat from Mons as the enemy cavalry descended upon them. And this is a, this is a, a quote from Sarah Marable's story published in the Daily Mail in April 1915. They ran to a place of safety, but before they could reach it, the German cavalry were upon them. So they turned around and faced the enemy, expecting instant death, when to their wonder, they saw between them and the enemy a, tr a whole troop of angels. The horde of the Germans turned around terrified and regularly stampeded, the men tugging at their bridles while the poor horses tore away in any direction from our men, allowing them to escape and save themselves. So the image you can see here is an artist's impression of Sarah Marable's story. Now, this dramatic narrative was enthusiastically taken up as the proof that would confound the, the skeptics. But when Marable was eventually traced and questioned by other journalists, it was found that she'd been misquoted and she'd got no idea who these officers were. She'd just heard it from someone else who'd heard it from someone else. So actually, it was a classic friend of a friend story. And this revelation was ignored by those who were promoting the claim. So in subsequent reprintings of the story, her denial was ignored and her name removed. As Macken said, none of the actual eyewitnesses were ever identified by name. This is one of the defining characteristics of urban legends as they are known today. Or as Macken put it in 1915, someone unknown has met a nurse unnamed who has talked to a soldier, anonymous, who has seen angels. But that is not evidence. And during the research for my 2004 book, The Angel of Mons, I was unable to locate a single reliable eyewitness, direct eyewitness account of a vision of either bowmen or angels that could be confidently dated before publication of the bowmen in September uh, 1914. Now, this is where the story takes a very peculiar turn. Um, I've said that I couldn't find any evidence, and I, I was absol I'm was absolutely convinced that um, it was Arthur Macken's story that triggered off the legend of the, the uh, Angels of Mons. But by one odd literary coincidence has led me to reconsider whether Macken's imagination really was the only source for the vision of Bowman and the Angels of Mons. Now, before he gained employment as a journalist, Macken was fond of exploring the slippery boundary between fact and fiction. And he was not the only wordsmith to conjure tales of supernatural intervention and magical armies from the cauldron of war. Because during the summer of, of 1914, as Europe stood on the brink of war, the creator of Tarzan, Edgar Rice Burroughs, was hard at work in Chicago, expanding his trilogy of Martian novels. In his first story, A Princess of Mars, a former Confederate soldier, John Carter, is transported by astral projection to the Red Planet, where he is drawn into a series of magical adventures. I'm sure some of you have, have read the books and maybe even seen the Hollywood movie based upon the novel. Now, in those novels, Mars is known as Barsoom to its warring tribes, and the alien warlords and creatures that John Carpenter meets mirror those from ancient mythology. The fourth novel in the Martian cycle, Thuvia, Made of Mars, appeared in 1916, and the phantom bowmen of Lothar appear in chapter seven. Now the Lotharians are a dying race. 
who have become trapped in their desert city, surrounded by, marsh, by, by mountains. The few remaining Lotharians have developed extraordinary psychic powers to defend their isolated city from attacks by hordes of green barbarians, the Torquasians. And when the Torquasians lay siege to Lothar, they encounter the Bowmen a fantastic army of mentally projected phantoms created by the sheer willpower of the few living Lotharians. That's the words of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Now, Richard Lupoff's biography of Burroughs describes the Bowmen as being so realistic that a vast number of casualties are inflicted on the Torquasians and the green men are repeatedly driven off. What does that sound like? In his 1976 study of the Martian cycle, Lupoff makes the link between the Bowmen of Lothar and the Bowmen of Mons, and he drops a bombshell. Burroughs' notebooks show that Thuvia, Maid of Mars, was written between April and June 1914. Burroughs completed the story during a furious writing schedule that took him from California to New York during that summer, and the finished type script was sent to his editor at All Story Weekly soon after the 20th of June. Now, if all these dates are accurate, and I have no reason to suspect they aren't, because they're based upon his notebook entries, um, then this story was completed at least two months before Macken's fantasy was inspired by news of the British Expeditionary Forces stand against the Germans at Mons. And Lupoff maintains that there is no possible way for Burroughs to have read Macken's story before writing his own tale and vice versa. So even if this was a coincidence, he described it as one of the most remarkable in modern literature. So just to leave you with this um, question posed, did the idea for Phantom Bowman at, Mo, at, at Mons and on Mars occur independently to these two authors, Edgar Rice Burroughs and Arthur Macken? who were at the time separated by the Atlantic Ocean, not in touch with each other. Um, and if so, how? And if this is the case, it may be an example of literary synchronicity, an idea that was simultaneously visualized by two powerful minds during this particular world crisis. Now, the concept of synchronicity was first coined by the psychologist Carl Jung, who, by co coincidence, categorizes the Angels of Mons in his 1958 book, Flying Saucers, as an example of a visionary rumor. Now, Jung describes synchronicity or defines it as a meaningful coincidence of two or more events where something other than probability or chance is involved. So I just want to leave you with this. Perhaps these two ideas were, as, as Jung opined, examples of a rare type of rumor, a rumor that emerged simultaneously in different parts of the world, but which differs from an ordinary rumor in that it is expressed in the form of visions or perhaps owed its existence to them in the first place and is kept alive by them. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. That certainly got my mental, um, my mental juices were running. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions that I can see in the chat, um, and I'm going to read read the first one out. So, um, sorry, it's just moved on my screen. Uh, where's it gone? There we are. Russian folklore has the legend of the white tights, uh, which is also a piece of battlefield urban legend. Uh, do we find similar examples of these sorts of tales on battlefields all over the world? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize when I'd started doing this research that there were stories elsewhere, but because um, I was just concentrating on the First World War legend, which was the one that was that was very well known at the time. And we were near the um, the centenary then as well. But ever since that time, um, I've had my inbox virtually every month. I get someone who's read the book um, or, or they've come across the legend and they found me online and they're sending me some example. I've had examples from Russia. Turkey, South America, all over the place. Similar sort of things about people summoning supernatural intervention. And as, as I mentioned, Macken himself, there's Rudyard Kipling's story, The Lost Legion. Um, there are various stories from the Bible, from, from, from um, ancient mythology, all of which sort of revolve around the same theme. So it, it is effectively, I would, I would describe it as a folklore motif, really. It's, it's so common. 
and every every culture has 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 a, has a has a legend of this kind. And it's interesting in the First World War. I often get asked, "What did the Germans think of this? Did they, you know, did they have a legend about some kind of supernatural intervention?" I haven't been able to find a specific legend, but they certainly thought that, that God was on the side of their soldiers in the same way that um, the British did at the time, and they were invoking, you know, their their patron saints and their the protections of soldiers themselves. And carrying the you know amulets and, and like like Paul Fussell said, people were, were although this was like a a twentieth century war with with all the sort of all the machinery of war, all the guns, the zeppelins, the tanks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, people were still almost existing in a medieval mindset in in terms of how they were interpreting, you know, this sort of apocalyptic battle between good and evil. You give a lovely, love, lovely, richly traced sort of idea of the interlacing of various sort of cultural fragments as they sort of span out or or, or simultaneously burst to life uh, all over the shop. Um, in that spirit, the second question uh, is, why is that man on the cover of the Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, book got the Batman emblem on his chest? <laughs> I have no idea. I just sourced that online because I had to it's find really it. Hard. You could write about the origins of the Batman logo and how it really traces back to uh, whoever painted that book cover. I think there are some even more lurid um, Edgar Rice Bur Burroughs um, covers if you go looking online as well. Okay. <laughs> uh, if, if, if it's not rude to do so, Dave, if I could sort of just um, park things there to keep us to time. Oh. Um, the chat can carry on on the chat, uh, but uh, take, taking taking a break there would be uh, would be really great. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, so we're going to have a short comfort break uh, now. Uh, if we keep it to uh, what's the time? So if we start again at twenty minutes past, that will give you seven-ish minutes worth of comfort. If you can squeeze some comfort out of seven minutes, um, thank you everybody. Uh, see you in seven. Okay, everybody. So, uh, so we're back. Uh, so, uh, Andrew, if you'd like to load yourself up, you're currently on mute, by the way. Yep. Okay. You can hear me now. I can hear you now, loud and clear. Lovely. Okay. Yep. So I'll go and share my screen. Yeah. Then I'll disappear once you're up and running. Um, okay. Yep. So That's you can see good. that, can you? That's looking good. It's what we need to see in the way we need to see it. Lovely. Excellent. Okay. So I'll start. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I'm Andrew Robinson. I'm a senior lecturer in photography at the uh, Sheffield Hallam University, and I work with David at the Centre for Contemporary Legend. And um, my talk, Photography, Fake News and the Restless Ghosts of the Gettysburg Battlefield. So we're going back in time a little further to 1863. Uh, and I should point out when I start, as I start, that I'm not exploring recent stories of ghosts and hauntings, and you'll find these on uh, YouTube and uh, online, but I'm exploring rather the uh, haunted photographs that were taken at the time uh, where we see the bodies of battlefield dead. So I should point out some of the images uh, may be a little gruesome. So to start, the interplay of landscape, memory and narrative, which we've been talking about uh, today, are central to the study of battlefield photography from the early years of the medium and a key to understanding one of the most iconic images of the American Civil War, this photograph from Gettysburg, published by Alexander Gardner. Oops, sorry, just to advance the slide. 
Uh, Gettysburg is seen as the midpoint of the American Civil War, the high watermark of a Confederate campaign. And whilst the war continued for two more years, it marked a turning point towards Union victory. The battle lasted for three days in early July 1863, with fighting taking place across a complex battlefield around the town. And the battle was closely fought with both sides making costly mistakes, resulting in the loss of many lives, until, and until the last day either side might have been victorious. And the battle still holds um, or casts a long shadow across American history, with more than 13, 1,320 monuments to the dead uh, at the site. Whilst the American Civil War was not the first war to be photographed, it was perhaps the first to be photographed extensively with over 10,000 negatives of the conflict exposed. In viewing such photographs, it's really important to realize that the technology of the day limited photographers to capturing the aftermath of the battle rather than the fighting itself. The wet colloidium process required glass plates to be coated, exposed and processed while the light sensitive emulsion was still wet. Thus, photographers had to travel with a mobile darkroom and both coat and process their plates in the field. And as a result, the equipment was too cumbersome to be used during the fighting. And photographers usually concentrated on taking portraits of key personalities, reviews of important locations, and photographing the aftermath of battle and the battlefield dead. We should also remember that those who photographed uh, the Civil War were not documentary photographers as we would understand that term today. Neither were they press or newspaper photographers, as such roles didn't really exist at that time. Rather, they were self-employed commercial photographers producing images for sale direct to the general public. As portrait photographers, they were no stranger to posing their subjects to produce the most effective image. And as uh, landscape photographers, they made aesthetic compositions, adding figures to the foreground to provide a sense of scale and depth within the scene. Much of the uh, photography at Gettysburg was originally credited to Matthew Brady, who you see sat on the in the right hand photo here. However, the majority of the imagery etched on most people's memory uh, from Gettysburg was produced by Alexander Gardner, his colleague Tim Timothy O'Sullivan, who we see on the left, and their assistant James F. Gibson. Both Gardner and Sullivan, both Gardner and Sullivan, had previously worked for Brady. However, had left after disagreements and Garner has set up his own studio in Washington. Gettysburg and he, sorry, Gardner and his party were the first photographers to arrive at Gettysburg two days after the battle on or around the 5th of July 1863 while burial parties were still at work burying the dead. Unlike the photographers who followed them, they focused almost exclusively on capturing images of both Union and Confederate dead before they were removed or buried, probably knowing that these would sell best. At the time of the Civil War, the latest photographic craze was for stereo views, paired images which, when viewed with a stereoscope, produced a lifelike three-dimensional effect. Soon after he returned from the battlefield, Gardner published numerous stereo views of fallen soldiers on the Gettysburg battlefield with short, simple captions, which were, were very, populated, very popular and widely circulated. In some of Gardner's images, the dead have been gathered together prior to burial and occasionally burial parties, shovels in hand, can be seen in the background. There are few, if any, bodies present in his photographs that have not been moved or rearranged in some way, mostly by Confederate or Union burial parties gathering the dead ready for burial. Many Union dead pictured, as those in this photograph, have had their boots and shoes removed and their belongings rifled through, probably by the poorly equipped Confederates, whilst others have had their pockets turned out or sometimes cut out, either to remove valuables or in an attempt to identify the dead prior to burial. The majority of Gardner's photographs at Gettysburg were taken in the vicinity of Little Round Top, which we see lower right in this image, Devil's Den, the Rose Farm. Now, Devil's Den is a, an area of rocky outcrops lying in a marshy valley at the top of two conical hills, Round Top and Little Round Top. Whilst the Confederate troops, this is on day two of the battle, the 2nd of July, 
whilst the Confederate troops were making an assault on Little Round Top, other Confederates attacked Union forces and artillery located at Devil's Den, and a fierce battle ensued, with the area exchanging hands a number of times before the Confederates secured the position. The lower slopes of Round Top, close to the Plum River, became known as the Slaughter Pen due to the large number of soldiers from both sides that died there. Confederate bodies were still lying in the slaughter pen when Gardner and his party arrived. And you can see it's not so easy to see them that there are a number. There's, I think there's an, around nine bodies in this photograph and two people standing on the rocks towards the left of the image there, which are probably Gardner uh, or O'Sullivan or, or their assistant. The Confederate continued to hold Devil's Den for the remainder of the battle using it as a shelter for sharpshooters who picked off Union soldiers on Little Round Top above. Now the two rocks that form the sharpshooter sharp sorry, the two rocks that form the sharpshooters den are located to the rear and slightly above Devil's Den, as you can see in this picture from Google Street View. And they're some way off from Little Round Top. Never, nevertheless, Union troops atop the hill would still be within range of Confederate sharpshooters located there. The low stone wall between the boulders in this uh, famous photograph may have predated the battle. However, it's most likely that they were built either by Union sharp sharpshooters and in the afternoon of the 2nd of July or by Confederate sharpshooters later that same evening after they secured the position. Due to the uh, stony and rocky nature of Devil's Den and the Slaughter Pen and the Valley of Death beyond, it was difficult to bury the dead in this area. Many were placed in shallow graves or covered with their blankets before being buried with stones. And there are many reports of decomposing bodies and skeletons becoming visible in the months and even years following the battle. Numerous dead and wounded soldiers also fell between the large boulders of the den and burial parties struggled to remove the decomposing bodies using hooked poles. It's also said that a number of wounded soldiers took shelter in the caves beneath the boulders during the battle, only to drown when the waters rose in the heavy rain that followed. In the years following the battle, many tourists and relatives of those who fell visited the battlefield and in particular Devil's Den. And in fact, an electric tramway, which has now been removed, was built to ferry visitors to the den, at the end of which was Tipton's photographic studio where visitors could have their photographs taken, posing against the rocks of Devil's Den. At this time, there were many local tour guides who would chaperone visitors around the battlefield, recounting tall tales of heroism and bravery. There are very few ghost stories, if any, from this time. However, bodies and skeletons would still be exposed from time to time in this area. Ultimately, these battlefield guides uh, were formalized and today certain guides take visitors on one to two hour walks around the different sections of the battlefield. And these walks are often videoed and you can view them on YouTube. The battlefield roads and paths can be accessed by Google Street View, which allows you to visit the site of Gardner's famous photograph and peer up at a little round top from the sharpshooter's position. Now, when originally published as a stereo view and cabinet card, this image of the sharpshooter was titled Rocks Could Not Save Him, just a simple short title. However, by the time it was reproduced in Gardner's photographic sketchbook of the war in 1866, three years later, Gardner recounts the story. He tells a, 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 an extended story about this photograph about how the lone sharpshooter, still lying in his den on the battlefield, apparently had been injured by a piece of shrapnel to the head, and he then laid down on his blanket to await his fate. Gardner also tells how the skeleton of the man was still present when he revisited the battlefield in the November of the same year, his rifle rusting by his side. Now, photographic histories and academic texts now explain how this image was constructed and staged for the camera. Often as part of a discussion questioning photography's credibility and authentic form of documentation. Indeed, a recent, um, in a recent BBC documentary entitled Fake News, A True History, 
Ian Hislop explains how Alexander Gardner first photographed the body at a different location before carrying it to the den to create a more aesthetically pleasing image. This accusation has haunted this image and the memory of the soldier pictured for more than 60 years. The truth, if we can ever know it, as is often the case, is far, far more nuanced and complicated than the BBC pro programme makers suggest. The narrative of the moved body was first suggested in a 1961 article entitled The Case of the Rearranged Corpse by Frederick Ray, who noticed that the same body appeared in a number of other images taken at a different location. So here on the left is the uh, den of a rebel sharpshooter, and on the right is another photograph entitled Sharpshooter's Last Sleep, in which we see the same body. And the photo on the right, there are a number of versions, four in all, the one you've just seen, plus these uh, three stereo views. Um, Ray wrote, I believe I may have caught the great Civil War photographer cheating. It's nothing serious. It just appears that he moved the body of a Confederate sharpshooter about a bit to get a better picture. And this is, is what's repeated time and time again, that uh, the, the body was moved and it was moved in order to create a better photograph. He does, however, suggest that, well, was the body was the blanket that's visible in the photograph used to carry the body to the area around the rocks or was it the other way around was the body carried in the other direction whilst of interest to civil war enthusiasts this revelation was not widely shared until the publication in 1975 of william a frasinetto's groundbreaking book gettysburg a journey in time Frazzanito's detailed photographic mapping and re-photography of the battlefield located the sites of the majority of photographs taken at Gettysburg through the meticulous comparison of identifiable landforms and features on the contemporary battlefield with those recorded in the original images, as you can see here. The photograph on the right being the one that Frazzanito took, uh, and he identified the rock here and the general landscape as being this location. In this way, he was able to locate both camera position and viewpoint, and in doing so revealed that the titles and locations of many photographs were actually incorrect, and also that the majority of Gardner's images were taken at only five different locations. Frazzanito was also able to accurately locate the site of the four images of the dead sharpshooter on open ground, as being some 40 yards from the den, and both repeated and further embellished the story of the rearranged corpse with greater certainty whilst introducing this fictionalised narrative to a far wider audience. Here's a diagram that he drew uh, of the relationship between the two rocks and, and this is what, well this is a summary of what he, what he wrote. Here then was the essence of the den's most famous role in the battle, that of a sharpshooter position for the Confederates. But one vital ingredient necessary for a perfect viewing was missing. There were no bodies. In what must have been a flash of creative excitement, the cameraman chose to improvise. Returning to the position they just photographed, Gardner's men placed the slain youth body on a blanket and in all likelihood carried him themselves some 40 yards up the slope. Now, this is a, an image from Google Maps showing the relationship between those uh, two locations. And actually, the distance is more like 70 yards than 40, although the figure of 40 yards uh, has been oft repeated. Uh, Frazzanito's narrative is actually a construction based on a series of assumptions concerning the order in which the images were taken and the identity of those who moved the body. There is actually no evidence whatsoever as to the order in which the photographs were taken, nor as to the identity of those who moved the body, nor as to how long it elapsed between the capturing of the photographs at the two locations. As Ray acknowledges, it's quite possible that the body was first photographed at the sharpshooter's den before being moved to the second location. It's also possible that the body may have been found somewhere else and moved to both locations. The body may have been moved by a burial party before being re-photographed by Gardner and O'Sullivan sometime later, possibly without even knowing it's the same body. In truth, nobody actually knows the sequence of events 
all the motivations and intentions of those involved. Nevertheless, the narrative provided by Frazzanito gained traction with both photographic historians and the wider public, and has been repeated time after time as an example of photographic construction and fakery. Here are a few examples from across the years. Gus MacDonald, in his uh, book, which was uh, a book of a television series, Camera, a Victorian Eyewitness, calls the photograph a fake. The founder of the CIA's National Photographic Interpretation Center repeats Frazzanito's suggestion as fact. And Brian Winston, talking about truth, damn lies, and documentary, embellishes the story still further, falsely suggesting that Gardner carried the body around with him and reclothed it as needed. Frazzanito's uh, interest in photography at Gettysburg has been continued by a number of battlefield guides and historians, and in particular by the two people in the earlier photograph uh, from YouTube, Smith and Gary Adelman, who jointly published a study of the history of both the conflict and photography at Devil's Den, and quite a few of the photographs I've used have come from this book, in which they again repeat the same narrative. In the internet age, the image of the dead sharpshooter and the narrative associated with it continues to provoke claims and counterclaims regarding the identity of the soldier, the position and pose of the body, the presence of sharpshooters in the devil's den, the rifle, the equipment and the other props present, and many other details of the image. The current interpretation panel on the battlefield again repeats Frazzanito's story, but adds a more reflective note. The photograph was staged, but the tragedy was real. A young man from the south lay dead far from family and home. This fictionalized narrative then has become accepted fact, repeatedly used as an example of historic fake news, implicating as it does both photographers and photography in the falsification of the past. However, you could consider this narrative itself to be fake news and perhaps the ghosts of Gettysburg should be allowed to rest in a more honest sleep. And that's the end. Talk. I learn to understand you much better if I can get familiar. Oh, don't know what that was. There we are. Um, thank you very much, Andrew. That was uh, that was really sort of uh, detailed, sort of almost forensic analysis of uh, uh, of that. Um, one thing that was striking me, I, I'm looking at the question uh, chat. I um, uh, can't see any questions coming in yet, but um, why did People want to buy photographs of uh, a, a corpse-strewn battlefield. I, I can't answer that question, but they were certainly very popular. I mean, the other photographers who photographed at Gettysburg arrived later. Brady, who's one of the most famous photographers of the Civil War, um, arrived maybe by the 10th or the 7th, between the 7th and the 10th, uh, according to Frasinito's timeline. Uh, and I'm sure he would have photographed bodies of the dead had they been available at that point. But by that point, most of the burials had, had kind of been completed. Uh, although, according to some um, uh, reports, first-hand reports in the area of Devil's Den, it was some time before all the bodies were buried. But Brady did a far better job of documenting uh, the Battle of Gettysburg, going around all the key sites. And Gardner and his party didn't do that. They they really concentrate. I think something like 70 or 75% of the photos they took were of the dead. And uh, they were doing this because they sold well. Um, and he had uh, the stereo cards were produced very quickly. You know, they were being circulated uh, within a, a month or six weeks, I, I understand. And, and there was a market for it. I suppose it's because, you know, this was a war on... On their home soil, it's it's it was you know the the consequences of the civil war are, are part of the the whole Trump presidency and everything, mm. uh, and I th I think there was just a great demand for anything from the battle and and the stereo you know I've, when you view those images through a stereo viewer they they come to life so it is it is perhaps strange but I can't answer that. I've got another one you may also not be able to answer but it sort of follows on um trophy photography when when cameras become more spread around and and and, and troops themselves can have cameras then sort of 
a similar macabre souvenir photograph for a coffee takes off and I understand that it it, it it sort of first happened in the first world war a any thoughts about whether the the sort of Gettysburg kind of photography sets up a a, a, a trend that then becomes more as it were democratized as people can carry their own cameras and have the same expectations of the same images that need to be brought back from the front I mean I think what was in terms of the Civil War, the vast majority of photographers were from the North. They were Union photographers. And so they approached it with a particular point of view. Um, and there's very little Confederate photography that took place. And apparently the blockade of the South limited the availability of photographic chemicals. So kind of, so, so there's a kind of bias to the photography, uh, perhaps. Um, I'm, that's not really answering your question, I guess. Um, but at that time, they, they were completely free to wander the battlefields. You know, there was no one. I mean, they arrived two or three days later after the battle had finished and they could go wherever they wanted and photograph whatever they wanted. And that's the thing that's progressively changed through the 20th century, yeah. uh, both in terms of uh, professional photographers, but also soldier photographers, you know, or, or people who have their own cameras. And in, in the Second World War, there's, you know, a very famous photograph was published in Life of two dead American servicemen. And that was quite late on in the war. I can't remember the exact date. And it was very, very, very controversial at the time. So morals and expectations had changed dramatically by then. They felt it would be too, um, neg you know, it would have a negative impact on public morale to show dead American servicemen. And of course, as in Vietnam, soldiers had quite a lot of, sorry, photographers had quite a lot of freedom in terms of where they went and what they photographed. However, uh, in subsequent wars, it's, it, they've been very much restricted. And in the Gulf Wars, uh, photographers had very little access to, or very little free access to, to what was happening. And a lot of the photography from more recent wars has actually come from soldiers themselves or from members of the public via social media. Hmm. Rather, rather chillingly in the chat, there's, there's a... Uh, comment pointing out that um, lynching photograph photographs were quite um, popular at the. That's true. Yeah, in America, they, they were very popular. A book was published on them fairly well. I mean, maybe about five or ten years ago, and, and yeah, they were they were printed as postcards and sold lynching photographs. Uh, and of course, you know, in, at that time, uh, it was quite common for people if they lost a, a child they, and they had no photographs of that child, it was it was quite quite common for. Uh, people to have photographs made of, of dead relatives uh, and keep them because quite possibly there were no other photographs of them at that point in time. So maybe there was a different approach to, to mm. death and photography mm. in the late 19th century. Mm. Thank you. I, I'm really not sure how to, how to raise the spirits and make us all feel happy. Now. <laughs> um, from, from, from that position, I think, thank you very much, Andrew. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll move on to, um, uh, to Rob Hindle now. Uh, so Rob, uh, if you're uh, out there, ready to load up? I am, thanks. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, I'm not sure I can raise the spirits, I'm afraid. Um, and okay, slide, So I'll just disappear because I can hear you nice and clearly. So That's great, yeah. I'm going to turn my, my camera off as well. So um, my voice will be coming out of the void because I've had a few connection problems this evening. So hopefully people can hear us okay. Uh, so I'll just turn that picture off. Okay, so this is this is called the Iron Harvest, unsettling grave goods and trauma in the killing fields of Western Europe. And um, I'm a poet, and I have an interest in interrogations of, of history through poetry. Um, it's interesting that we open the evening with the uh, the picture. Uh, Lauren Malkovitz's uh, depiction of the Memorial Forest, and she talks about scars, scarring. Um, and I think what I, what I've got a particular interest in is um, the interrelationship between uh, trauma and how it how it, it sort of manifests itself in um, in culture. And we heard earlier about the Angels of Mons, which uh, appear in one of the poems I'm gonna read later. Um, I think in many ways, poetry is a process of disinterment um, uh, and can often uncover trauma 
Um, if we think of Seamus Heaney's uh, first major poem, Digging, um, or what he later called dropping the, uh, the, the bucket down, someone's saying no picture. I'm, I'm not using slides, um, so it's just, uh, just the voice and some reading. Okay. Um, so my interest, I think, is like as, as it is with archaeologists, is in what remains. Um, and how can we interpret those remains? Or put another way, um, what haunts us? But also, why are we haunted? Uh, like Rebecca Hearn I, and, and uh, others before me, I'm, I'm drawn uh, to the battlefields of Western Europe and the hundred years of, of killing uh, that's left in many ways a, a fertile soil for this kind of inquiry. Things aren't buried safely, they persist, they endure. Um, like Heaney, my digging, uh, which resulted in this collection uh, of poems called The Grail Roads, was in my own family's garden, so to speak. Um, I went with my father a few years ago to visit uh, northern France to the site of where my great grandfather, his grandfather, was killed in the Somme in 1917. Um, and that developed into to a collection of poems which situated Mallory's questers in the trenches, uh, drawn out of this recognition that uh, this battlefield had been uh, live over many hundreds of years, including battles uh, such as the Hundred Years War that Mallory supposedly had a direct connection with an experience of. <clears throat> um, in the book, uh, I include an essay uh, which is called The Iron Harvest, an Archaeology of Sources, and I'm going to start by reading from that essay. The villages are ancient and they aren't. Aerial photographs from 1918 show nothing but dark wheels. Yet here are hedgerows, huge trees, honey-stoned cottages and walls. Graveyards cluster along the lanes, the same stone cut into trim slabs and lined up, almost touching. Everything is small and close. A hundred graves in a garden plot, six villages in a 10 minute drive. A hundred fields run down to the river Ankh. I look at the maps from 1914, 16, 17. The villages disappeared, but the red lines were more or less the same. Men came up that road year after year and were killed. When it was finished, people came back, rebuilt their houses, planted trees, ploughed the land again. Around Ypres, over the border in Belgium, farmers call it the iron harvest. Each year their ploughs uncover munitions, barbed wire, remnants of rifles. Sometimes the flotsam of older conflicts turns up, lead and iron from the Napoleonic Wars, known until 1918 as the Great War, and from the Hundred Years' War. Digging down takes me through horrors in the cultural strata. Wilfred Owen, who fought in the same fields as Albert. Napoleonic Frankenstein and his mon monstrous progeny. Goya and his. The macabre paintings of Hieron Hieronymus Bosch, who lived in the shadow of the Hundred Years' War, three million killed. And Thomas Mallory, knight possible veteran of France, probable career criminal. Here is a rough stitched portmanteau of French romances and Celtic myth, spun with Christian morality and nationalism for the domestic market. And at its core, capacious and contradictory, the heroic doomed quest of a fading empire. Bones jut out of the earth, men, men sent to fight someone else's battles. Those returning tell horror stories, or they stay silent. The first poem I'm going to read is called Third Eep, which 
we also know as, know as Passchendaele. And this is about the iron harvest and its psychology. There is nothing left but land, pitted and treeless. It ekes out into the mist, empty of roads and walls, hedges and fences. Flanders was a farming place, small tenant holders and breeders, pigs, poultry, flax, fodder for cattle. Now it is fallen fallow. Each autumn after, ploughs will haul an iron harvest from these, from these fields, the tilth stony with shrapnel, ballasted with mortars and mines. Cracked gas shells will bleed their sour scent to the air. Bullets will clutter each row like seeds washed out by floods and storms. The soil is deep here and always will be worked, however strewed with grave goods. Sappers talk of axe heads, ponyards, rusted blades, the clotted guts of cannon, gauntlets with their clay hands, relics from an older world they keep as battle charms. And in among the bones and skulls of these three years, a catalogue of ochre ribs and knuckles crudely disinterred. Splinters of men sent here to kill and die in worn fealty. They are more than half earth. Still their ghosts migrate the dark and unrepentant fields. As I said, I, I situated the story of the holy uh, of the of the Grail, Mallory's uh, telling of the Grail, in the in the trenches of the Western Front. So these next poems are from a sequence called Ghost Stories, in which Lancelot writes from hospital uh, to his son Galahad. Lancelot having been badly inju injured in a representation of uh, his failure to achieve the grail, whereas his son did achieve that success. 4th of September 1917. Your grandfather visited last night stood by the window quietly, his face a shadow. He had fought in wars, had come home partly deaf and prone to tremors in his neck and chin. Now he was here, mute and still, a ghost attending his diminished son. After he died, there was a letter. He told me in it of his youth, some stories of our family meeting my mother. Nothing of war save this. Serve well your country and king, but in battle fight for your own, or you won't live with what you may have done. 8th of September, 1917. <clears throat> Early in the war at Mons, a story grew amongst the men of ghostly knights who fought beside us. I saw only soldiers, the Wayne and his company. Melias, badly wounded in the fray. Hector, who thought one of the ghosts was you. It was a shell-shocked tale, the way back from a nightmare. We trailed south, delirious, unsleeping, straggling through coal heat to the Marne, where we made at last our roll of honour. Your name, thank God, unwritten. 16th September. The doctor tells me I am mending well, no doubt. I walk across a ward and back and back again. Even in bed, I'm hardly still. As soon as I can hold my pack and gun, get down the steps to a waiting car, I'll be for the front again. It's raining. For two days, it has rained loud on the windows. Late last night, it eased and I could hear it running in the drain. I fell asleep and saw a man consumed with gas, froth at his lips, kneeling and dying wretchedly. I wanted him to die and be still, but he went on with his dying, his throat full of a kind of speech, a clicking and bubbling, alien, utterly human, unintelligible and clear as day. So what I was trying to do, I think, is to describe trauma 
and the outcome of trauma in visions of ghosts, appearances of ghosts. I'm going to read a little bit more from the from the essay and to talk a little bit about survivor guilt. As I said in the in the last sequence, I was describing the 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 uh, um, letters from Lancelot to his son Galahad uh, in the quest story Galahad uh, achieved the Grail, uh, which I think is a is a metaphor really for um, his death, and he was seen as the as the uh, the purest of the questing knights, whereas Lancelot, who was worldly, didn't achieve the Grail. And it struck me that there was a parallel between this, this, this Christian story and the idea of the First World War in which the noblest uh, and bravest were those who didn't come back. And consequently, those who did had to live with uh, this, this uh, trauma and guilt. <clears throat> a picture on the cover of the book, Forgotten Voices of the Great War, the book is full of personal accounts, but it was the cover, hand-coloured, that got me. Three injured soldiers walking towards us through a wrecked landscape, their faces bearing witness to horrors we can never know. They could be the champions of Mallory's quest who return, damaged but alive, to tell their tales of prowess, ultimately to fall quiet, broken, perhaps, by survivor's guilt. In that story, it is those that don't return, Galahad and Percival in particular, who are most celebrated, pure, heroic, whole men who sacrifices the ultimate ennobling destiny. The soldiers in the photograph, two British, one French, walk in step, arms linked in fellowship. What binds them, the shared experience of war, won't help them in their return to the everyday. I'm going to conclude with a poem about the shell-shocked survivor. And this is about Lionel, one of the knights who I've cast as a German officer. And the poem is called Aller Seelen, which means all souls. One. Long after Lionel stopped seeing death at every gate and style, the grey light of October, its scent of leaves and fires, would send him shaking to his door. He had ended up in England, a prisoner working in the northern factories, then in the farms. In a place near Ripon in Yorkshire, the women had spat at him through the fence. One brought him cider, which turned out to be piss. Out in the fields, it was better. Just him and his fellows, board guards, the larks and rooks, the wind. The last summer they grew pumpkins. It was hot, the days full of wasps and midges, their mookan. As they bent along the rows, weeding and pulling out snails, he glimpsed the fat orange heads lolling in the canopy, eyeless and silent on their gangling necks. Sometimes he'd reach in, touch the cobbled crannied globes. Sometimes He'd stiffen and sway like the heat had got him. When harvest came, they loaded carts and wheeled them through the fields to the barn, stacked them in a heap. There they sat, bloated and glowing the half-light, like reptiles' eggs. Two. On Alasilan, they would leave the church at dusk and walk among graveyards with candles. No one would talk. No one would leave the path or look in the shadows. Halloween was the same, and it wasn't. As the light fell, families put pumpkins out on doorsteps and in their windows. Light would judder through carved eyes and grimaces into the dingy lanes. The thickening night was full of cackles and screeches, innocent and terrible. Lionel sat up the whole night, haunted. In the morning, the houses loomed in fog. Every noise, yard brooms, doors, 
boots on the road to the fields rang or scraped sharply. A pheasant snut stuttered like a sniper. The track to the farm dropped between hedges wet with webs, a puddled trench centred with dripping alders. A gap opened into a fallow strip, weedy and degraded. In the farmyard, a row of pumpkin heads sat on an upturned bath, their eyes empty and flared with black. They were dead and cold and squalid in their death, clumped together in an execution, each staring separately into the gloom. Okay. Lovely. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to check if you had finished there. I didn't want to start talking and, and talk across you. Um, thank you, Rob. That was uh, that was very evocative, and it's always it's always interesting as a contrast when we, when we don't have images because because our brains suddenly start whirring, going, "Hang on, what's going on here?" And and I think that became quite haunting because of that tunneling of uh, uh, of uh, uh, of our senses into into trying to listen to your words, and even the the. The, the stuttering of the audio probably helped us to feel even more discombobulated of, of, of uh, getting that sense of dislocation um, that I think you're trying to summon there. I, I just wanted to ask you a question. I'm, I'm looking at the chat to see if anything comes in, but um, you mentioned that at least in part your origins for this collection was in sort of family history. And I, and, and I just wonder to what extent your, your, your projects of writing this was purgative or exploratory of a family relationship, or is, is that too too simplistic a way of looking at it? You have fairly dark themes in most of your writing, so um, I, I, I know it's not all family connections. Just wondered if you want to tell us a little bit about um, why you do what you do. Um. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, I'll answer the first part of the question because it's probably a bit easier. It might it might sort of lead us towards the second. I think um, <clears throat> I think there there is a fascination for a lot of people in their own family history, and particularly uh, around things like the First World War, and particularly when, uh, as in in the case of my great grandfather, um, his body wasn't recovered, so it wasn't a case of going to a grave. Or a memorial. It was going to a, a to a, a landscape and to a place and looking at documents to try to locate um, where he was reported as being being killed. Um, we went to find that place and we could only sort of find a, a probably a square half kilometer or something like that. And my father and I walked to the end of a path in the middle of a freezing field in February and got as far as a pylon. And the path stopped and we just stood there freezing for two or three minutes and did that very British sort of nod at each other and turned around and came back to the car. Um, so I think it was it was a kind of a, a bit of a, um, a joint effort, a sort of bonding expedition in a way. Um, and but, but I think I, I, I became interested in this before we before we conceived of the visit so i think my i i am i'm drawn to i'm drawn to these dark themes i think because i'm interested in the unsaid um I'm, i put on the chat when we were talking uh, uh, around andrew's uh presentation before mine about the uh, the fact that in 1864 there was a lot of photography done around the sheffield flood um which is another another topic that i've i've sort of focused on and I think my interest is in the gaps that are available to um, writers like myself, because you are working with the unspoken and you are able to inhabit those gaps and, and give voice to um, to people who have, have died in, you know, some um, historic event or another. Um, I'm also interested in the relationship between how we how we can mythologize uh, events such as the First World War 
um, I think the First World War for me is particularly interesting because it, it kind of stands in a way at the edge of myth as, as we lose our direct connection with it. And someone alluded to that earlier on in the evening, then things can become uh, mythologic, if you like, and it's, it's sort of exploring, you know, that, that idea um, and the sense that our, our our cultural attitudes have changed and we viewing viewing things from sufficient distance gives us a, perhaps a different uh different take on things um at that point that they are that they become they become myths and the, the danger for me in, in in things becoming myths is that they they occupy a position uh which projects our own sort of cultural identity in some way and i suppose it's about questioning that you know is it is it was it a war about heroes what what were those heroes doing that was heroic um and you know the interest around galahad and so forth is that that seems to have persisted throughout um you know sort of many hundreds of years that the idea of the hero might be someone that looked like the guy with the batman badge uh, you know, protecting the uh, the uh, helpless woman on on Mars is something that that has persisted. So I think it's just about getting into that, you know, into those gaps, exploring those unspoken voices from our perspective, and um, the the multi layering really in this particular collection, as I say, of, of, of war upon war upon war and futility upon futility. I think. You know the huge mound of me that that you showed from Rebecca's presentation. I think just just sort of is a is a real symbol of that. Lovely. Well, thank you. And, and you've left us with the symbol of a huge mound of futility, which uh, I think is another deep place that we've fallen into. But thank you very much for uh, for summoning that. So. Um, Last but not least, and, and also just for clarity to explain that I've spent my 10 minutes, so we won't have any wrap up comments from me at the end. I'll just say polite endings. We now have the uh, allotted 20 minute session with David. So, uh, uh, David, once you're up and running, I will switch off my mic and switch off my image and let you get underway. But I'll just hang on whilst you uh, whilst you launch. Um, so. That working. That's that's uh, that's working. Lovely. Um. Okay. Oh. Right. Um. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me, Luke. It's it's quite an amazing session. I've really enjoyed seeing hearing um from the other people here first. The I'm I'm not really in this discipline in that I I haven't really worked on cultural uh, folklore and and I haven't really kind of looked at haunting. But when I was um. When I was trying to understand why I've been invited in, I started realizing that possibly this is something which is a bit of a theme of my life anyway. Um, I realized as a child of the 70s, I'd been haunted by borrowed memories of Britain's conflicted history anyway. Um, as a kid, uh, war was romanticized in comics. It was continuously memorialized for the landscape of London. And it was retold through family witnesses to enormous suffering. And then finally, because we're always at war as a small country, it was mediated through the vivid photography and footage of journalists. Um, I have made work which does relate to um, a sense of kind of the presence of memory and landscape. Um, there's a tritus and stereotypes of the past, and I even made a performative artwork where I marked the place where somebody had fallen at Waterloo at one point, um, and I tried to make a piece of future military archaeology. But I was asked to talk about a project called Monsters of the Id, um, which leads me to a slightly different approach. Monsters of the Id um, was an enormously complex and fatally flawed artwork, which ultimately didn't quite work. Um, but it, it is interesting because the intention behind it and the reason why I had to kind of go through that exercise was because I started to believe that maybe the monsters of our imagination, rather than the ones that we can document, might be more powerful instigators to aggression or even the reminders of the fallacy of war. So the term Monsters of the Id comes from Forbidden Planet, 
um, a great and terrible film from the 50s, um, where um, it was um, based loosely on The Tempest and clearly influenced by a lot of Freudian um, kind of theories. And um, it was based on um, essentially the a, a kind of metaphor that um, they were they were fighting an enemy, but they weren't absolutely sure where it was coming from. And I'll return to that at the end. So in a very loose roundabout way, I'm going to attempt to rapidly get through a quick journey, which led me to that point, starting from what you might think of as evidence. So 2008, I was in Afghanistan as a war artist, and I was nominally kind of able to see exactly what war looks like. Um, I was in intended field hospitals, so it was very safe, a long way from any threats to me personally, but deeply upsetting and kind of traumatic experience. I found that for me, part of the, some of the, the anxiety were, were things which actually were mentioned just, just in the poems a moment ago, kind of the, um, the guilt for not actually, um, for, for surviving, for not being, not suffering while witnessing other people suffering. Um, but also there was a sense that uh, although I was being fed, what I was told was the reality of conflict, I was aware that, that I remained quite ignorant in terms of how this thing actually related to any wider narrative, whether it had, whether without context, when you're simply close up looking at the, the legacy from a violent act, whether it's possible to ever reconcile that with any kind of sense of story or narrative or whether it's possible to suggest that that might be something which relates to a heroic story or actually whether it relates to something which is entirely criminal. I think for most people involved, it's almost impossible to decide that. I think most of the times that they spend much of their life afterwards hoping that other people will decide on their behalf that actually that anxiety is assuaged by the belief that society thinks that what they did was justified. I travelled and managed to get out into Afghanistan, but of course I didn't really see Afghanistan. All I saw was a landscape through lenses either through my own camera or through the barriers that were constructed around me to keep me safe from whatever threats might or might not be out there. I was told continuously that if you traveled beyond a certain point, snipers would get you or the, the, the ground would open up with mines. And there, were, there was a sense of fear, but it was almost always abstracted. It was very hard to prove. And when I came back a couple of years later, I looked at my pictures and realized that actually you could strip away Afghanistan entirely. And the thing which was resonant wasn't the landscape beyond, but it was the frame I was looking through. I um, I tried to contextualize that strange experience of being in the middle of chaos by going back. So I went back with a tourist visa um, and I traveled into the north in Kabul where ostensibly at that point, the war was, was passing in that there were still soldiers on the ground and there was still evidence of massive destruction but it was a memory of war that was embedded in the landscape. You could see the acts that had happened rather than seeing acts happening in real time. As I traveled around, I kind of began to look back at the bubble that I was in and kind of um, sort of see the, the architecture of military, militarism and the, the strange kind of aesthetics and the bravado and the fear from outside of these armored cars looking back at them. I started to sort of uh, see myself within a false narrative that I've been fed. As I left Kabul and traveled further across the north, I started seeing structures which are quite similar to the ones that the British built, which had been abandoned. These were Russian. So this was the Russian Camp Bastion. You might remember from the news 10 years ago, Camp Bastion was always there. This was the Russian camp of 3,000 people, now demolished entirely apart from the shower blocks and the sewers. And I traveled across to the Panjshir Valley, which is one of the most beautiful places on earth, but also the place that's most heavily carpet bombed, where if you didn't know what you were looking at, you might just think of this as an extraordinary landscape. But if, as you get further into it, it becomes obvious what it means. The natural, natural geography of the, of the valley meant that the Russian armored cars would come through and they'd get picked off by shoulder mounted missiles that the Americans and the British gave to the Mujahideen to, to attack them with. And that landscape there, despite attacks by the Russians, by Taliban and other areas, other groups, 
never actually managed to be conquered by anyone. The tomb to Masood over here was a reminder of what was going on there prior to my arrival. And if you stood there long enough, you started seeing people arriving from the hills, dressed in camouflage gear, looking a little bit too old to be soldiers. That Robbie's there from a previous conflict. You climb into the hills and the mountains, and you're struck by the awesome beauty of the landscape. When you get to the top of the ridges, you start seeing paths which kind of snake down from one mountaintop to another. And when you look down at your feet, you start seeing shell casings. And that's because the places which in the Lake District or in uh, Snowdonia might be the most perfect places to hike up to to get a, an extraordinary view of the landscape and contextualize yourself or also happen to be the best places from which to get a vantage point from which you can survey a landscape and attack an enemy. The landscape on the surface uh, retained kind of mines and shell casings and if you, drug, if you dug into the surface slightly or if you looked through some of the small apertures, you start finding bunker complexes. Some of them were still being used, most of them were empty. Traveling through the landscape, you'd see the memories of not only kind of conflict, but also the kind of the initiatives and the dreams of politicians. So this is a chemical factory the Russians left in Northern Afghanistan. They also built schools, like the same way that the British and the Americans tried to do in the South in the same way that the Mujahideen and the Taliban did. Um, but there was, a, there was a problem. I had a problem, really, in that the landscape I was looking at, it appeared safer when you weren't in uniform. It felt safer when you weren't being protected. There was an ambiguity as to who was attacking you and whether actually it, they were attacking you because you were there, because of what you represented or because of what you were doing. When I came back to Britain, I struggled a little bit to understand how it was that we had entered into a situation where we were viewing that landscape from satellites, from long range cameras, from drones, and trying to find a, a way of kind of understanding what it was that was malevolent on the ground and why the, why people um, hated us when in reality there was something in my mind that was was becoming clear when when the war on terror started when 9/11 happened there was a, a general feeling around the world that something horrific was about to happen not just that it had happened there was a sense that the revenge would probably cause more trauma and harm than the original act. And perhaps that was why um, Al Qaeda wanted to cause that act to happen in the first place. It was really to kind of cause this end game to happen. But there was something interesting that it, when, when Afghanistan became a war that once more kind of dragged Britain into it, it didn't take long before people drew parallels with previous conflicts that we've been involved in, in Afghanistan itself or in the region. And there was a sense that they had always kind of ended badly. And the reason for that was partly, I think, just a complete failure of understanding of the landscape they're in. But it was also that um, it was clear that you could, you could never dominate a landscape of people that were essentially refusing and unwilling to, to, to be ruled by an outsider, but also that your own presence in the landscape was creating the threat that you thought you were there to, um, to curtail. The British, when they were building out from into Helmand province, they came up with a plan where they were building small forts. They'd advance the forts and they'd kind of, uh, every, every half mile, they'd build another small fort so that you could see one from the next to the next. And each one, the idea was that you gradually uh, gain territory. Of course, as soon as you build a fort, it becomes attacked. And the, the forts attract a huge amount of kind of coordinated kind of aggression. And then they unleash vast amounts of firepower and anger back onto the landscape in the assumption that if, if you fight hard enough, if you're 
organised enough, if you've learned enough from Northern Ireland, if you've learned enough from your previous military campaigns, and Britain has always had military campaigns, that somehow you'll be able to kind of win that conflict. But the strange thing that didn't seem to become clear to people, at least not on the ground, was that perhaps the only way for the for the uh, the war to stop was actually not to be there to cause it. There was a question as to whether the violence would happen if you weren't there to witness it, or whether actually being a witness was causing the violence in the first place. In Forbidden Planet, Prospero over here is living on a on a planet which is suffering from some malevolent force. A previous kind of species has left a, an incredible kind of amplifier built into the planet. And when um, Leslie Nielsen turns up to inspect what's going on, listening to a distress signal, and excuse me if I'm paraphrasing this wrong, but um, he begins to realize that there, there is something lethal and terrifying on, on this planet. You can't see it. You can only see it by its implication on other forces. So you can't actually see the monster of the id, but you could see the shape of it as it kind of tried to force its way through a laser cordon. Or possibly you would see the impact of it on a large steel door. But you would never actually see the object. And the strange and kind of rather beautiful idea is that actually it was the fear of the monster that was creating the monster in the first place. It was a projection of self, it's a projection of your worst nightmares that was actually creating the thing which then they were beginning to fight. It's a simple analogy, but it was something which I thought was interesting. And I kind of decided that a few years later, I would play with this idea of, um, which partly related to Finn Planet and partly to a wonderful Ray Bradbury story that you may know, which was, um, collected together with a, um, a group I either called the Illustrated Man or the Golden Apples of the Sun. And the story was called The Velt. And in The Velt, there was a, a room where potentially children or um, could project their imagination onto the room and they could, they could smell and hear and almost taste the, the landscape and the ideas that they wanted to project out there. It was the most incredible kind of toy. It was a fantastic immersive environment. But in the veld, inevitably, this becomes a place of terror because the children's imagination may not be as benign as the parents had hoped. And what you find is that the room becomes something which, first of all, appears to be simply showing something of the of the unsettling and settlement in in the minds of the of the viewer. And then there's a question as to the room it's, whether the room itself has taken on a life of its own, and actually has become a, an entity or a force that is no longer dependent on the viewer. I thought it would be interesting to try and make a room where there is nothing in there until, unless you're there to watch, kind of Schrodinger's cat type experience. So I came up with a plan with John Hansard Gallery, which was a gallery which didn't have any kind of internet network or in any uh, great history of completely taking over the place with technology. And I didn't have a huge amount of knowledge of technology. And we just decided we we're gonna try and do something which was technically just probably slightly advanced of the technology that was available to me. We installed a couple of connect devices, which provide a thermal map of, of this circular room, which had been once designed to um, act as a, a maritime simulator for the Solent and then become a contemporary art gallery. And I, I made, I set up an array of projectors that would be able to project on that surface. And the idea was that that landscape that you're looking at, this rather abstracted landscape, would be empty unless you stayed there for a while. If there were more people, then you would form more of an attraction. If there was one person, you, you created a stronger attraction if you stayed longer. And if you stay there long enough, eventually people might begin to migrate towards you from across the horizon. In other rooms, there are artworks which appear to be kind of unrelated, but actually they are all networked. So in this room over here, if you attract people to come over the, over the horizon towards you, in the next room, what you might see is, looks like a small kind of insects moving across, or actually the shadows of the population beyond the horizon. And you start seeing a shift in their, in their pattern as they migrate across this landscape. 
if there's somebody in the room next door. And then there was a third room. And in this room, the, the, the people are almost invisible. There's virtually no Im impact of them, but you're looking from 5,000 foot up. And in this space, the idea was that you would be again looking over the same landscape that was modeled in plaster dust, which was used for the vertical projection, the same landscape which the virtual characters might be trying to navigate across. But in this case, you'd be looking at it as spectacle with no uh, possibility of empathy. The actual show looked almost like the visual representations, but just was a bit more glitchy. It produced this kind of uh, this vacant landscape. And if you stay there long enough, glitchy characters started coming towards you. Standing kind of to witness you. It was it was funny to take a picture of this. You actually had to have somebody with you that would sit there long enough to, for it to happen. And if there were people in the room on the right there, you would find that the landscape on the left began to populate differently. The little shadows moved across. And over here, you would see the contrails of a, a sky which appeared real and a landscape which possibly seemed more photographic, but was, was actually a landscape that had been 3D scanned from that plaster dust in the room next door. It was as imagined and invented as everything else. And then finally, there was a room with what appeared to be a, a laptop and a controller, but that was being controlled by the system in the rooms elsewhere. Essentially, the kind of the choice of who was in charge, who was controlling, who had the intention was kind of ambiguous. And there were two things going on here. One, I was anxious to try and suggest that the way in which we engage with a, a landscape is not necessarily the name of the landscape or the role that we have, but it's also the position of perspective we have. It was the sense that the empathy, the projection of self seems to happen more through that kind of first person engagement. And it allows us to be possibly deal with the abstraction and believe that that's tangible when we're far enough away. When we're looking at a macro position, we start imagining a world that is not the one we inhabit, but one that appears to have a logic that we've become familiar with. And the other thing, I suppose, really, was just that it's possible. I believe that actually to really understand conflict, the representation of conflict, the actual literal evidence, the documentation of it shows us the aesthetic and the spectacle. But to understand what the conflict means, why it's happening, why there is fear, sometimes allegory and fiction is a more appropriate way to engage with the subject. I think that's my 20 minutes. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, David. Um, you, you make a nice, nice connection there between your, your own experience as a, as a war artist and, and if you like what you brought brought back and therefore what you then went on to make. So thank you very much for taking us through that, uh, through that journey. Um, how do you feel looking back on, on, on your time as a, as a war artist, you know, with all the issues of embedding and uh, um, uh, enablement? That, 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 what, what's a war artist for and how do you feel about having been one? I think it's the most compromised role you can have, really. Um, I mean, I've always been a pacifist and I was brought up a, as, a, as a Marxist um, by, you know, kind of, and I was on all the marches against, you know, kind of, uh, I think I was on march against Gulf War One with my parents, but certainly against the contemporary Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Um, going was a very strange choice. It was really about the question of if you're given the opportunity to test the assumptions you've made from a distance and you turn it down, is there a, do you lose the authority to actually kind of continue with that critique? I knew that I'd be institutionalized and I knew there was a chance that I'd be corrupted. But I think the important thing is to understand what it is that you're learning. I wasn't learning about Afghanistan. And the key thing there was for me to recognize that instead what I was learning about was a strange parallel culture, the logic of conflict, where it's possible for a society within the military to have come up with some form of convention which allows them to temporarily at least stay sane while committing acts which would in normal life be seen as the absolute edge of sanity. 
and, and beginning to understand how that culture can exist with all of its contradictions, with the machismo, the aggression, even some of the poetry that comes within that. Kind of seeing it as something which in Britain we don't often see because it's often a, a world which is just over the horizon. Because of the troubles, we weren't engaged with the military, even though we have quite a large presence in the country. Unless you travel on the A roads rather than the motorways, you wouldn't know how many bases we have. Um, but the other kind of key thing for me, and this was the main thing, was that I only really have authority as a civilian, a consumer of conflict through the news. Trying to read The Guardian, trying to watch Channel 4 News, thinking I'm a responsible, intelligent, thoughtful, kind of like critical viewer of news. And realizing that it's really easy to fill in the gaps when they're talking about Southeast London, because you know a bit about Southeast London and you can say actually, well, that's a bit superficial. I, I know more than that. But when, when you're being fed things about a country which is being exoticized and conflicted, it is possible that even with the best intentions, we can find ourselves developing a superficial, simplistic understanding of what that represents. And although we understand the illustration of war and we're very good at representing it, I think to actually empathize with the reality of what that means, the lack of meaning and the lack of narrative is something actually which I realized that the mediated forms um, that we use to document and display conflict often led us down in that way. And for me, that was the great shock when I got there was that I realized that as much as I tried, I hadn't really understood what it was that I was about to walk into. Thank you. Thank you for being so uh, uh, candid and also reflective in that. Um, I'm looking at the questions. Uh, I think I think we're done and I think we'll quit while we're ahead. And I promised everybody I'd finish by half past and I've gone three minutes over, but every, all the speakers have had their allotted time. So thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, audience. Thank you, the technology that enables this kind of thing. Uh, and um, until next time, and I'll send around details of the final event whenever I invent those details. So thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Excellent.